to visit without me and Moya. I'm a business law attorney who focuses on intellectual property and privacy law, so consumer data protection. So, okay. I'm Florida native. I went to a bachelor's degree from the University of South Florida, St. Petersburg. My law degree from the University of Dayton in Ohio, which is where I got my intellectual uh, property concentration. I'm a licensed board attorney. I'm also a certified information privacy technologist. Um, I'm on the board of our committee on technology. I'm a privacy advocate, and then I'm on my social life. I'm one of five sisters. Um, I'm an aunt of seven nieces and nephews, and I also have two. Um, not children, so. <laughs> so I want to go ahead and clarify the difference between you know, privacy and security. So as the slide states, security relates to how information is protected, whereas privacy relates to our right to control our personal data. So that's kind of a distinction in like a big privacy, consumer privacy advocate. So most of the stuff that we're talking about relates to how companies, small, big, and cyber large, are collecting, using, and distributing our data. Uh, like I said, the bottom of all the two often overlap, they're not the same, like they are in some of these companies. So, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the internet, the thing is the basic concept of having non traditional uh, connected devices, having them connected to the internet or other devices, and have them uh, exchanging and sharing data amongst the networks. Um, example of our car, the appliances, you see the doorbells, the ring. Apple Watches, heart monitors, thermostats, and much more. The goal of IoT devices is to improve the way that we work together. Uh, while there are many and various different benefits regarding having uh, these devices connected, there are you know great risks. Uh, so I'm going to elaborate on some of the pros and cons. So the pros are, like I said before, the life enhancements, connectivity, uh, and then different mediums to connect and understand individuals and to kind of make our lives better. The cons are um, the existence of our individual part of privacy. We are constantly being tracked all the time. It's interesting to see um, when are we ever going to truly be alone, and then how is our failure to ever be alone or in solitude going to affect how we interact with others and how we even um, participate in a room by ourselves. Um, so then too much understanding, knowing too much stuff about someone, and then untraditional discrimination. So as a lawyer, you know, only, I can. Hundreds of only um, only certain types of discrimination is prohibited in the United States: that age, sex, um, disability, national origin, race, and kind of some kind of sexual orientation. Um, so there are other ways to discriminate against people. For example, your health insurance. When you plug the things into your car, they're tracking that information, and while that's not legal discrimination, that is discrimination based on the information you're providing them. It's important to kind of weigh the, the pros and cons of social impacting our um, data and what Others based on their data and after that actual interaction. Um, so these are some fun facts regarding some of the topics I'm going to cover. Um, and like I said, I'm a business law attorney. I work with a lot of startup companies, um, usually brand new companies up to like medium size. Um, but it's important to note that 43% of every tax are targeting small businesses. Uh, next one states. For a typical Fortune 1000 company, 10% increase in data accessibility will result in 65 million additional net income. And this is to go to prove that, or to show or demonstrate that these companies, not only are they collecting our information um, free of cost to them, they're actually profiting highly off of the information they're collecting, our personal data. So then, globally, it's just talking about the national the numbers of devices and connections per capita will grow from 2.1. 2018 to 3.6 by 2023. And then 87% of US persons can be identified because only these three um, data points would be able to your postal code and your gender, which is kind of shocking um, to know that you can just be, I guess, pointed out in a room full of people with just these three data points. I think they're very, we get these out all the time, every day. Um, so usually, I know this is kind of a strange note, but I have logging into anywhere and they're asking for my information on your life, my birthday, um, my zip code, I get a different zip code, or the app, my person, my last initial, first name, I don't give them that, I'll give them a first, um, first initial, last initial, sometimes like we need more than three letters, I'll give them the first three letters, just make up something. And it's very important um, to just control your personal data, because like I said, they're, they're profiting off of it, we're not really doing much in return. And then, 
Just throw me some yes. Estimated that by 2019, IoT devices will generate more than 500 zettabytes of data a year. That's a lot of information. And, uh, generally, these um, companies aren't even, they don't even know what to do with this much data. They're just collecting it in hopes that maybe some kind of deal will come out better than so, this is an interesting concept that was coined by Daniel Zola. He is, uh, this one actually in 2002, um, he is a highly respected privacy uh, scholar. And the definition of a digital biography is listed above. Basically, it's the fact that all of our information that's being collected is creating uh, an online database about who we are as individuals, kind of without our consent. So, I'll read it out loud. It says, it is a totality of information aggregated together that presents the problem. Consolidating various bits of information, each in, an, in itself, is relatively un unrevealing. However, it can, in the aggregate, begin to paint a portrait of a person's life. And this is crazy because this was in 2002 before, um, before we produced as much data as we are today. He also quotes in this. Um, publication that indeed database marketers frequently classify consumers into certain categories based on stereotypes about the values, the lifestyle, and the purchasing habits. So my logic and my theory is that without ethical data collection and these practices, these digital biographies are essentially unauthorized biographies about themselves, um, are only providing partially true or partially true and reductive information. So I talk about the ethics of collecting data because we all know that data is very, very valuable. Uh, it's very valuable. However, we need to make sure that these companies are for one, collecting it with our consent, um, collecting it with our knowledge, providing us notice, and giving us control over our personal data. So the next slide talks about the cost, of the monetary and financial cost of um, data. The kind of probably all things more. So um, data breach can cost anywhere from 1.25 million to 8.5 million. One nine million, and it varies based on the industry and the country. The average cost of uh, data is about one hundred and fifty dollars, one hundred and fifty dollars per record. Uh, so it kind of depends on the size of the company and how much data they actually collect. Um, Twenty sixteen, the global average cost is about three point six two million dollars um, in U.S. dollars, and that was just in the United States alone. And of course, the cost. And it carried on for years following years, depending on what you need to do to um, correct problems. So, while there are breaches, not all data breaches are privacy breaches. In order for it to be a privacy breach, it has to be, uh, there must be personal data involved in the breach. So, I think you kind of all know what the way for data breaches are very malicious insiders or access controls by encryption, cyber data, data loss, and system breaches. So outside of the financial and monetary costs associated with um, death breaches, there are also damages to reputation. There's a loss of customer loyalty, um, business disruption, fines, penalties, legal, and government competition against individuals like personal loss. Uh, and I put this quote, I'll put this um, statistic from Facebook on there because this is actually not a criminal breach. It was a um, it goes to the FTC. The FTC, yeah, the FTC and the privacy violation based on the fact that they were not set. Facebook was collecting a whole bunch of information about us and nobody knew about. And I think it's, I actually got off of Facebook because of this. I haven't gone on Facebook and I'm very reluctant to join social media's website just because of the information that they collect. And so there's nothing wrong with these businesses collecting our information, but it's all about ethical collection, allowing us to opt in or opt out control, notice, um, and all of those. So like I said, if you're basically a large company and they can kind of take a five billion uh, hit fine, but the issue with smaller medium-sized businesses, they will like to make up. This will ruin their entire business model, which is why if you are working with a small company and they're collecting information and not using any ethical data collection practices, you might have, it's in the business's best interest to start implementing some of the policies that we're going to be discussing today to make sure that, you know, Consumers or clients, customers will not be outraged in the event a death breach happens. And on the same lines, I truly believe that um, when consumers understand and know that their information is being collected, the likelihood of them being truly outraged and stop using that product or service will is less because they already use that information and understand that they're going to be 
So this kind of goes into the same subject, the importance of ethical data collection, and it states that there is a significant gap between data privacy and consumer trust. Uh, it goes on to say that only 20% of U.S. consumers completely, completely trust organizations to keep their information private. 75% think that businesses focuses on profits over consumer privacy rights. Um, 77% back their company's ability to keep their information safe um, in their purchasing decisions. And then 78 of the United States consumers say the company's ability to keep their data privacy is extremely important. So, like I said, if you are working with a small or medium sized business, these are some of the consumers, despite what you may see or encounter, this is something that consumers actually do care about and that they are um, taking into consideration when deciding which product or service to purchase. So these are the general um, privacy principles and standards. And these are just the basic of these. Depending on how much data you're collecting, who your customer is, they can kind of vary from industry to industry. But the basic is just collection limitation. Like I was saying before, these companies are out here collecting all this information. They don't know what reason they're collecting it for. They're just collecting it. So you need to have um, limit the data that you're collecting. Don't just collect it all. Have a reason and purpose for collecting it. And the quality of the data. Um, Make sure the data you're collecting is the best of your ability to secure it. Make sure it's necessary for the purpose. Try to make sure it's accurate, complete, and update, and allow the data set that the individual consumer an opportunity to correct the information if it's wrong. And then, perfect specification. This is a real issue. A lot of these companies are just, are just collecting this information for no reason, just, just to collect it. So, uh, it's important to put the purpose of your, the purpose of your Data collection reason, have it in a notice, um, and then you have to change it without providing the consumer with uh, the list. And then in terms of use limitations, um, don't disclose it, don't use it, don't make it available for any other reason, the one that's stated in your privacy notice. Um, security safeguards, protecting against risk of loss, unauthorized access, construction, use of application, disclosure. And the level of security, of course, maps the level of the level of the information. So the social security number, of course, is entire, highly regulated, uh, highly secure. If it's birthdays uh, or the kind of location, they shouldn't still be regulated, but um, I guess the level of the, of the personal information is not as personal as a social security number, as a social security number compared to the vehicle that's mobile driving. And then Openness, um, openness and transparency is another really good topic in the area. Like I said, consumer, are you looking about why you're collecting it, what you're using it for? Um, consumers will be more inclined to actually give you information, which will essentially help out new business depending on how the business model and what the data that's uh, Individual participation um, allow the consumer or the data set that they really need to request that information. To collect that, to communicate about the information, to correct and release the personal data. And then lastly, accountability. Um, make sure that you, if you have a problem, if you, make sure that you are abiding by the privacy policy in your organization. So the difference between the privacy policy, the privacy policy is the procedures that your organization implements, whereas the privacy notice is just putting the consumers and the data subjects on notice of what is being collected, used, disclosed, and shared. So, um, a way to implement all these policies and procedures is through privacy by design. This is actually a GDPR requirement. The privacy, privacy by design simply means that when you are designing new products and you are thinking about privacy as a part of a that system within a product or service. Um, and along those lines, it's supposed to be proactive. You know, have privacy by default. Um, make sure privacy is embedded into the design of the product. Make sure that's fully functional and serving all the different interests. That's interest so a win-win, not just um, you know a benefit to the company. Make sure it's a benefit to the, the users as well. And then intent, security, visibility, and transparency, and of course, respect for the users. Uh, so, how to bridge the gap between an ethical collection uh, practices and like we require insight to the privacy practices. Try to do some polling if you can to figure out how much information people are willing to share about what. An opt in, opt out approach is really, really best. Um, and I feel like if you are creating a useful product or service, 
and the consumer can understand that, they will be more inclined to opt in to have you collect your own data, particularly if you're providing them with value. If the data can be used for any kind of inference, you should notify the individual about the purpose of that inference, and if possible, and required by law, uh, allow them once again to opt in and opt out. And inferences include the kind of discrimination I was talking about with the, um, and the GPS tracking and the sensitivity tracking on a vehicle just to ensure that if you are going to increase your, increase your rates based on the driving, just disclose that. And I hate to say this, but people don't really need notice, privacy notices anyway, um, but sure. if you put the information in there, you can say you tried to notify them about the information that they were that you were collecting about them and it's up to the individual to choose not to, um, to choose or not to choose to use that product. And that's even more so true when you're allowing them the options to opt out of um, location tracking or contact tracking. Um, just allow them options to select what information they want to share. Like I said, if they see a value, they likely will share um, that information. I know as a personal example, uh, I drive a lot for work, so my mile has a tax deductible. Um, <coughs> once has an app that track, tracks the location, and I drive a lot. Not all of it, but did, not all of it is for business purposes. And it's crazy because I did not want to use the app because I don't want to track my location all the time. Um, but there's so much value to it. If I personally, if I'm, I don't have an app that's constantly tracking me, then I have to personally track all that information. I would never do it. So last year, I ended up losing a bunch of money in miles because I kept forgetting. So I finally turned it on. Um, reluctantly, and Apple now alerts me. They're like, QuickBooks has tracked your location 300 times in the last week. And it's just like, and you know what? I, and like I said, I turned it off before, and I just truly I understand the value, and you know, I skim through the privacy policy just to see you know what you know who they can share it with, um, and it's just a risk I'm willing to assume. So you know, you guys have say in your company to let these, um, I guess, the decision makers know that if you are providing value, that the customer understands the value, they're more inclined to opt in to let you track all their other locations in the and then before intruding into private affairs, physical, psychological, or self representation ensure that there's an opportunity to control and limit the intrusion at appropriate times. Uh, when it says at appropriate times, it means um, don't just have, I guess when you first settle an app, don't just have it so that you can um, opt in or opt out that like do it when a pop-up needs to come up if it's trying to connect to your photos, a pop-up needs to come up at the, that time, or if you're trying to connect to your contacts or show your location at the time that it's relevant, that's when it needs to pop up so that the, that the consumer can understand um, the pros and cons of allowing the organization to collect your information. So, if the data is um, used to make critical decisions, that can deny specific benefits like the insurance, uh, like the insurance example, increasing or decreasing their um, rates. Just to make sure that the individual safeguards to make sure the information is accurate. Because if you're increasing my premium and you know your system for testing how poor they're, um, how bad or good I drive, and the information you're collecting is, is incorrect, something there's a disconnect here. There's a huge disconnect. Now you're discriminating, it's discriminating against me, not only because of uh, my data, but because of incorrect data, that your system is incapable of correct. Yeah, exactly, incapable of correct. Um, and the next one is to react quickly to customer concerns. So allow an opportunity for the consumer to connect or to communicate with um, the organization if a problem regarding their data, and then try to correct those concerns as quickly as possible. Of course, build that trust and that um, reputation and rapport with the consumer. And then lastly, assume that interference will occur and try to plan for it. So, things to consider when it comes to providing a consumer with notice about your data collection processes. Um, so, what data is being collected? Uh, how that data is being collected? How that data is being used? Who has access to that data? What is who is not? Who within the organization has access to the data? Not everyone in the organization doesn't have access to all the data. Only if they're trying to analyze it or process it, do they need to have access to that information. But whom the data may be shared or disclosed. We all know that a lot of parties, a lot of organizations like to work with third parties, so that's fine if it's for a specified purpose, as long as you're providing notice that 
information is shared with that organization or with that third party. How well the data is being kept and how it's destructed, how it's destroyed at the expiration of that timeline. Um, the level of control over the individual's level of control over the collection and persistence of the data, how that data is protected, how to access and export that data if the consumer needs to do so, and then lastly, how to connect with organizations that have any questions or concerns regarding their data collection processes. So things to consider when it comes to choice of consent and control. So choice just provides an opportunity to have input regarding the privacy um, control over how the personal data is used, which is kind of sometimes hard. I don't think I've ever actually seen this in an application where they um, they usually allow you to have choice in what information you provide them, but they rarely ever allow you to control how they are using um, And then consent. This is, this is generally implied consent by using an app. You know, they don't, don't really give you many options to opt out of entire data collection. Um, yeah, opt out entire, entirely of collecting your data. Um, generally, when using the app, you're considering to have your information collected, stored, and used. And the best practice is, of course, is to obtain consent before collection to avoid the exceptions and, of course, allowing opt in and opt out. And then, choice is only relevant, for consent controls are only relevant if it's needed. Like I said, people don't read the notices anyway. It's in the notice, but we're not actually giving them the option to opt out. There's a disconnect. The disconnect is not actually between the choice, it's just a, it's a, a facade, I guess. So, things to consider when it comes to use and disclosure. So, use is just processing the data in any way. Um, if you're just kind of collecting the data, you're not really, like a space company that's collecting and not really using it, that's not considered use. You're analyzing the, if you're analyzing the data and trying to make decisions about the data that really use comes into play. And um, it's important to have user authentication, like I said before, and to provide a limit to people who have access to the, to the personal data in the first place. If they do have access to it, make sure that they have you know, one ID password, possibly two factor authentication, multi factor authentication. Um, then, access controls, make sure that only certain people have access to the data. Once again, not everyone in the organization needs to be able to access um, all consumers. Location or date of birth or addresses or phone numbers, email addresses, stuff like that. Audit trails, if you are giving individuals access, you know, I say individuals, you're giving individuals in the organization access to personal data, um, audit these people, figure out how often they're accessing certain records, why they're accessing certain records, and just have a law so that if something happens, you know, um, you know the pattern and you know why these people are accessing it and when they're accessing it. And then lastly, secure and card clocking. Um, We've probably seen this multiple times where you go somewhere and they ask for your social security number and you write it down and ask it down on, on the table. And it's like, can you, can you do a little better than that? Um, so those outside of the digital world will actually secure any hard copies of the consumer's personal information. And then disclosure, if you're disclosing information, um, you don't always need, in order to analyze data, you don't always need to know the you, know, you can have, you can know, you can, have a general idea of someone's preferences without associating with the name or with the user. And a lot of the time, you can still use this information, you can still profit off of this information without being able to recognize that, oh, that's a that's person's information, that is person A, person B. So that's a way to um, disclose the information under a pseudonym. Anonymization is usually a little difficult because, like I said, it will reach um, data portals, your, your data work, your zip code, and your um, gender. You can automatically generally find out who you are, so anonymization is more difficult. But then, when it comes to disclosing information to third parties, make sure that however you are transferring it, make sure that that transfer route is secure. Uh, if there's remote access, just make sure that on their end, they're also doing what they need to do to make sure that you know their employees um, are just not not making it that third party vulnerable to your information. And then the last I just have this other quote. Um, one of the biggest challenges is around data privacy and what is shared versus what is not shared. And my perspective on that is consumers are willing to share if there's value in return. One way sharing is not going to fly anymore. So how do we protect and how do we harness that information and become a partner with our consumers rather than just a vendor? And this is by um, the head of data analytics. 
analytics, um, data and analytics for the city bank. Uh, the final takeaway is how to implement um, these policies and procedures into the organization. So kind of ask yourself, uh, does your organization have an appointed data protection officer? Does your organization consider data protected data protection issues as part of the design and implementation of the system service products and business habits? Does your organization make data protection an essential component of the core functionality of the processing systems and services? Does your organization anticipate risk and privacy and risk of events before they occur and take steps to prevent harm to individuals? Does your organization process only the personal data needed for the specified purposes and use that and are they using that data for the specified purposes? Does your organization ensure the automatic protection of personal data and IT systems and services products and your business practices? Does your organization provide contact information of those responsible for data protection within the organization? Does your organization provide an easy to read privacy notice that explains how the consumer's data is being used? And then lastly, does your organization offer privacy default, user friendly options, and control with respect to your practices? And it's crazy because they're very simple questions, but if you go into any organization, big or small, the likelihood of them saying yes to any of these are probably a And that's all I have. As an attorney, um, do you think that uh, the ethical protections um, are the current ethical protections are adequate, or should people demand codified criminal prohibitions against? Uh, uh, exposing people's personal data. So, I don't know if the criminal route is the right way to go um, because I just don't think I. I understand why it would be a better route to go, but I don't think so because for one, the federal government is shy to act on this at all. I think we've only had two states that are actually acting on this, um, and I think rather than trying to regulate this on a larger scale, I think we just need to. Let these businesses know that it's our information, that we care about it, and that we are not standing for it anymore. And then they can hopefully regulate themselves rather than having the government right now. Does that answer? Has, has that worked so far? Um, as a privacy attorney, I struggle greatly, to, especially working in the startup industry, to have these businesses and organizations value privacy. Their issue is because, like, oh, we'll worry about it later after we're And it's like, that, that's not okay, and I understand why, especially in startup culture, because they don't have funding to make privacy a priority. However, if we are out on the streets demanding this, and we're not using products that products or services that do not value our privacy, then these um, organizations have no other choice but to, you know, get up to date. As in the Facebook example, people are, I mean, what was it, five million dollars in fines? Like that, that's a great example. I think people should, you know, see that and think. Let me do better. If you don't have the funding to implement any of these policies, and you don't need to be in that business collecting that much information. That that was my follow up question, which is uh, five billion fine to Facebook doesn't really do much, but if Zuckerberg has to do five years in jail, that might change the corporate culture. Um, possibly. Okay. Possibly. Any other questions? Um, I guess with respect to only collecting data for specified purposes and using it for intentions that are stated up front with POS and things like that, do you really see that being followed today? Because I feel like we see a lot of you know, lawsuits and a lot of misuse of information out there. And, uh, you know, people are selling information and, and it turns out nobody knows what they're, what they're doing. Like, are you really seeing that that's, that is the holiday? You think that is a current requirement on the specified purpose? Yeah, they're, they're facing, are people really following that? And is there any legal precedent right now? Or are we heading in the direction? I think the that's right, right? Uh, the enforcement of the GDPR, GDPR has been having issues as well. And it's hard to, um, there's just there's so much data out there. There's so many organizations that are collecting it that you. Unless there's a real wrong, which maybe this is kind of why the criminal would be around take, unless there's a real articulable wrong with actual damages, it's hard to really enforce these policies. Um, but I feel I'm a firm believer that, you know, if you know, the consumer as a whole, if we stop using these 
products and services that do not value privacy. They have no other choice but to um, open follow through and actually, you know, use this information for a special purpose. Um, along those same lines, is that these companies they don't even have a special purpose. They don't, they, they don't even think, they don't even think about trying to come up with the information. They're just like, oh, we'll put a location tracker on it. Why not? Maybe one day we'll figure out what we can do with this person's information. Um, so, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, 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 I don't um, we have to demand our right to right? it's our personal information and proper content. We don't mind you having it, but let us know what you're doing with it. How does you having that information benefit you? From a, from a federal legal standpoint, um, is there really a good solid definition? There's a lot of different definitions for personal information. I've seen a lot of different you know, interpretations of what that means. Some people say it's you know, a name or social or whatever. Some people say it's a combination of two or more things. I mean, to me, someone knowing where you're at at all times, I mean, they can build a history of everywhere you shop, of where your family and friends live. Like, that to me seems like very personal. I think the quote that I have at the very beginning is it's not about the individual data that you have with people, it's about these digital biographies that we've created about us that we often don't even know about. Um, and so, like, the digital biographies that we've created about us that we often don't even know about that are ultimately some organizations are making decisions about us for us. I think that's where the issue, I agree, you know, somebody might say their first and last name is private information, um, or that their name is private information, his email address is private information, but I think where the problem is where they're collecting all this information and data is creating a whole um, biography about us, and then I think in the marketing industry is a great example of it, when you're sending these ads tailored to you exactly, uh, there's nothing wrong with that, but allow us the option to choose if that is something that's something that we value best in the Some companies, like in response to this, have like started developing using like identification numbers instead of using people's names or like, mm-hmm. names of that sort of thing. Like, potentially for their identity. Do you think that that's like from a legal standpoint, not just from a personal standpoint? Do you think that that's a reasonable expectation of how they to hold those companies to, or do you think that that's something that's still is not? I think um, there's so much data out there that it's kind of hard to get back on the thought. But I think that it's a great step in the right direction because I think the issue that we kind of have is not a matter of having the information, but having all of our information, knowing that that's us. Like if it's an ID, then okay, cool. I mean, I could be anyone on the street. You just know me by a number. You don't really know me personally. It's not really going to affect, I guess, my my. Reality, if that kind of makes sense. Um, I think I, I don't mind to them. I really don't mind to them, especially when you can't, if you cannot get the information and figure out what the patterns are, it's useless. It's useless if you're collect, collecting the information of their student um, and able to make decisions based on that and then, you know, uh, increase the points that we've been getting points to make our lives a little easier. And while I understand that, you can't. Do that without being able to organize the data in some way that's meaningful. Yeah, well, if that was the purpose. That is the purpose of IPv6. Every individual will have their own unique IP address when it's fully implemented. That IP address will follow you around. That IP address will become you. You will be tracked and identified by your IP address. Okay, I don't know much about that. So I So I have a related question about uh, open your data as a service. Like, so, for example, Facebook, you have a lot of data through their website or app. There's a lot of third-party apps that we know when you sign up and log in, and that app is to set up with your Facebook. Or, you know, are there any tagging around laws there of like, liability for a third-party app developer for sending you the data towards it? Um, I so still kind of go back to Facebook because they're the ones that actually. Well, I personally don't do that. Okay. Uh, they ask me to log in with the third party that they're doing it so they can create this biography of um, I opt out of it. Do it. It's inconvenient because you know you have to create all these different logins. Um, it's inconvenient because you have to create all these different logins, but at the same time, it depends on how much you value your privacy. At the end of the day, a lot of these third parties they don't even need your. They don't need to be linked to whatever. Your information is, they're just doing it just 
to create this database of more information about you for you know, an unknown specified purpose. Exactly. So have you seen, on now at CCPA this past, have yes. you seen more people worrying about the US data as that just the European? Uh, no. <laughs> I really have not. Um, maybe the bigger corporations that kind of have been on the funding that are worried about being sued. Um, I think it's slowly um, more businesses are just starting to care about it, but I think it also makes it difficult for these businesses because it's hard for I mean, California to say most people are doing a lot of business with them. Um, and I think New York is a big one as well, but as all these states <coughs> do it, how are you going to comply with all that puts a burden on, on the businesses in general, which I feel is going to prevent people to collect this information. So it's not a collection of information we're worried about, it's allowing us the options to control our information. You have to use the strictest privacy rag yeah. that you're under. That's the one to follow. Yeah, exactly. So, Massachusetts Privacy Rag and Massachusetts California. Yes. Yeah. Good California. Yeah. Once New York and Massachusetts, Chicago, don't get a little bit of it. I think those will be the privacy shit. Yes, I think so. For sure. Yes. What, cult what cultural differences do you think contribute to the UK having GDPR and their populace propelling the protection, privacy protection forward compared to what we have in the US? So, um, I think in the United States, we first have our, our um, First Amendment rights, and then we have our constitutional rights. Um, and the right to privacy has never really been, it's, it's always been based on case law. Um, the case law is just kind of all over the place, and it's really only been dictated when it comes to criminal law and how, um, like, searches and seizures. And then as far as the privacy, as far as the civil route, the U.S. is only just prioritized financial and the health industry. So I think that I guess it, the UK is taking a more proactive approach um, because they understand the, the implications of this violation, whereas the US is kind of just doing it sector by sector, kind of letting us all figure it out. Um, it's one of the UK's long range. After well, Brexit, they, they dropped out of the EU, <laughs> which is GDPR. Would you say the difference between the EU and the United States is the EU is more consumer driven and the US is more business driven? Well, um, I'm not too um, familiar with the social economics of the EU, so I can't speak to that. Well, you know, very, the EU uh, kind of behind that is to put more power in the hands of the consumer. Yeah. The United States doesn't want to do that because businesses are lobbying because of the money that they make off collecting our data. Because your credit report is not your credit report. You know, in the United States, information about you is owned by whoever collects it. It's not owned by you, even though it is about you. For more information, I, I think um, that you may be partially incorrect. I, it's their information as far as it is a trade secret. Um, but as far as who owns the information, nobody has ever, to the best of my knowledge, made a decision on who owns that information, which is what the issue is. There's no ownership right for, for our personal information. Okay. Um, everything you talked about is consumer based. Is there anything legally that employees. Is there anything like from a legal standpoint for like an employee's uh, right to privacy? I've actually done research on this and I wrote a paper about it. Um, and that's a whole other issue. There's, like I said, there's only those, what, five ways of, five types of illegal discrimination. Um, so technically, if your employer finds out that, you know, anything outside of your age, sex, national origin, um, race, or disability, they can, I don't want to hire you because you're on Facebook too much. I don't want to hire you because you go to Walmart too much. There's nothing to stop them at all. And that's what's, that's what's crazy about it. Anything else? All right, well thank you guys. Thank you.